love about it is the science of it. It's all so crisp, you know, because so many guys build a supercar and they get uh, some variation of a Corvette motor. And it's loud and it seems to be moving quickly, but it's not doing with with any scalpel-like precision, you know what I mean? Yep. It's like a, like a machete. It's just sort of yep. making a lot of noise and blowing a lot of smoke and, you know. It's just fast, I mean. Yeah. And I mean, it shifts lightning quick. I know, it's great. Welcome to that episode of Jay Love's Garage, the car featuring today Mercedes-Benz AMG uh, 2021 Black Series GT. This is pretty much the top of the line for street cars for Mercedes-Benz. We couldn't get one from Mercedes-Benz, so I called my friend uh, Robert Hershevec, you know, from Shark Tank, ultimate car guy. Uh, this is his own personal car. It's got the very rare Project One paint job. This is, you only get this, well, I'm gonna bring someone in who will explain. You know, that's what I love about Mercedes-Benz. You know, a lot of car companies, when they send a representative, it's always like a marketing person and they study the specs. See, Mercedes-Benz gets real race car drivers and Tom, uh, Tommy Kendall is an ambassador, four-time Trans Am champ, Motorsport Hall of Fame. Tommy Kendall. Tommy, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Now, this is the Project One paint job. Explain what that is. Yeah, when I saw this, I'm like, Jay has some uh, serious pull, and now I guess it's serious friends. But uh, this edition of the Black Series is a pr the Project One edition. There's a new hypercar by Mercedes AMG that is basically a hypercar with a Formula One powertrain in it, not a Formula One derived powertrain, actual out of the Formula One car from a couple years ago, is, and it's in the, the hypercar. Oh, cool. Now, is that a street legal car? Ah, good question. It was supposed to be, and it is everywhere except the U.S., but they couldn't get it federalized for the U.S. So the ones that are coming here, I think there's like 50 or 30 coming to the States. Those are going to be track only. Now, this is, is this all carbon fiber? Uh, it's not all. There's a ton of carbon fiber. Obviously, uh, hood, roof, right. front fenders, but the doors and the rear fenders are, are not carbon. Um, when I walk up to this car, I realize how far things have come. You know, uh, for example, the, the exhaust here, you actually exhaust the air out of the, out of the hood. Right. Most cars, all cars have radiators. They usually just let the air work its way out. Right. Well, as the cars have gotten more higher and higher performance, it, the aerodynamics becomes more important. And so if you have slow air, which is you want it dumped out on the top, so the stuff you want to get it out of the top and you want everything under the car moving as fast as you can right, right. and so that's what creates a negative lift or downforce right. and so you know you actually have kind of a gt3 style hood where the you know it exhausts the air out and right just through all here these... and when you say exhaust what don't people think you mean yes. engine exhaust yes. you mean just exit a... of radiator so air. it yes. goes through the radio and it literally comes outside yep so it's only under the car this much and it before it comes off off the top of the hood. correct and that's that's radiator and intercoolers because obviously you're generating so much heat that's kind of the upward bound for internal combustion engines is how much heat you can get away and so the front of this car if you were to take this off would be almost all radiator and intercooler to to get that heat out you know there. it's funny i love steam cars with steam cars it's the exact opposite anytime heat is escaping you use uh well, you used to use asbestos, but you use you know, like, uh, what do they call that, um, furnace cement, to, just to keep the heat in. in. Right. This, you're trying to keep the heat out. And I imagine if you're driving this, you put your hand out the window, you're going to feel that heat coming off there, coming no, past. No, the if you're running it hard, no question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what is the weight of this car? I was guessing around 3,000 pounds, but it's heavier than that, isn't it? It is heavier than that. It's pretty good size, as you can tell. It's 36.55, right. which is not... A featherweight, right? Um, but they've clearly gone to great lengths to get it as low as it can. Um, you know, extensive use of carbon fiber. Uh, it's got lightweight glass front and rear, um, magnesium, all this kinds of stuff in various places. It's got thin wall stainless for the exhaust system to get the weight down as much as you can. As every literally every gram spinning or moving has to be accelerated, turned. And stopped. You know, that's kind of, you know, I love W.O. Bentley cars, you know, in some 1919, 1931, and they were big truck like vehicles, mm -hmm. you know, in fact, Bugatti called them the fastest trucks in Europe. But aluminum block, a lot of magnesium, same thing. You start with a heavy car and then try to get it as light as possible without compromising strength, you know. 
that's what's so cool is everybody has a slightly different approach. They're right. like, okay, we're going to make it crazy light and it's just not going to have as much power because it won't have the displacement. Or someone says, you know what? We really want huge power. So you're going to, but that's going to, the plumbing and all that is going to cost some extra weight. So what, what do we see this uh, competitor? Is it the Porsche 911? Is it the McLaren 720? Uh, you know, is it, it's, it's probably in that category, it's isn't it? Porsche's, you know, the, the Nürburgring class of car, basically, right. that's chasing the outright production record. Right. Uh, the GT2 RS Porsche, you know, the super powerful rear wheel drive Porsche, it had the record. Then the Lamborghini SVJ with active aero came and broke that record. Right. This came and broke both of those records. Mercedes or Porsche put out a Mante Edition kit on the GT2 RS that brought them back right. the record. So it's kind of the top of the heap of super track focus. They're basically GT race cars with license plates. And the Project One is above this. Yeah, Project One's into the hypercar class, like with like the the uh, Aston Valkyrie that Adrian Newey designed right. and so forth. And, and obviously, with all the Mercedes emblems here, this is all part of that. Is, is this the color too of the project? Yeah, this one? is the. Uh, I, I think you can spec your Project One however you want. The one they've shown uh, to the public, Project One, is is just like this. And this is kind of from the F1 car. There was a while when the back half of the F1 car had all the little uh, three pointed star. Uh, logos on it. So, so when I first, when this car was first released and I saw this paint job, I said, ah, it's a little bit much. But then it grew on me. And then when I found out that you can't get it, of course, that then you got to have it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Then you want it. Okay. Now you can't get it. Okay. I want one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what are we looking at here? 4.4 liter V8? It's a four, four, liter, liter, four, liter, four liter, liter V8 with a flat plane crank, meaning okay. all the journals are in the same plane. Right which is gives it that really unique sound it's harder to balance you know which is why people do the the different fire well the different cranks but uh you know the the four g uh, the new z06 has a flat plane right. crank i believe the gt350 shelby the just ferrari has a, yeah. the ferraris so it, it, it has a much different sound it's dry sump to get not only the oiling under the extreme lateral loads but also to get the weight as low as you can get it a little bit lower to the ground uh because you don't have an oil pan and the flat plane crank allows you to rev another three or four hundred rpm more in it yes you, i would don't quote me on that, but right. yes, that's the appeal. The, the higher revving stuff tends to be flat. I plane. know I've got that Mustang 350, mm -hmm. and that has a flat plane crank, and the red line's 8400, yeah. and an American V8 8400. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, you know, because I always remember. I always talk about this. When I was a kid, I saw the movie with James Conn, Red Line 7000, and he's, yeah. the, the, you know, the take it easy, you're gonna blow. You see the tech 68, 69, yeah. Yeah. 60, hit seven. You know, hilarious. Yeah, very funny. Well, I mean, everything in every way. I mean, technology is so amazing. Right. Formula One engines were up to 19,000 for a while, you know, whether it's output per, per liter, you know, with some of the, the, the cars we're doing now, electric's a whole nother uh, mind well, let's, bending. Let's thing. open the hood here and see what we okay. got. Okay, I think I'm, it's right here, isn't it? Oh, is it? Probably underneath. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, oh here it is. Yeah. There we go. There we go. And twin turbo. Look at that. Super light. And thank you, Mercedes Benz, for having the hood go straight up and down. You know, I hate that kind of come in from the side kind of thing. They've had this feature for years on a lot of their cars. Yeah, it's called a service position. Right. And usually you have to actually push a button on the struts to get it to go all the way up. This one, I guess they figure if you're opening it, you want access. Right, 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 right. But okay. you can see the intricate, the carbon, the ducting, the heat shielding. This is what ha uh, all of the GT versions, the four liter, have what's called the hot V. And so people are used to the turbos being uh, on the lower side, right here, the turbos are nestled down in the V, right, and so it actually has a bunch of benefits. One of it is uh, much better uh, emissions on startup. Right. Little things that uh, even in a car like this, they pay attention to. We, you know, of course, you've got the badge of the the gentleman or the woman who uh, assembled this actual engine from start to finish over in a Falterbach, and and the heat. The more you seal it off the more important, you know, you're, you're, you used to be you had air flowing through, but now that all the uh, radiator exhaust is going up there, right. there's no f airflow in here. So things that you wouldn't think about have to be heat shielded more or maybe do 
divert a little bit into here to pull some of the heat away. So everything has a cause and effect. You know, it helps the aero, but hurts the cooling. You know, I was at the AMG factory, and it's really, I don't think it's much bigger than my garage, at least when I was there. This is 10 years ago, 12 mm -hmm. years ago. And, you know, they let you kind of yeah, put a piston in, you know, get, give it a shot. I mean, it was, it was kind of fun, but to, just to see the hand assembly, and I'm a sucker for this. I want to know the guy who built my motor. You know, Aston Martin does that, and a few others do it. And uh, that seems to be the trend now. You get to know yeah. the person who built your motor, you know. One of them has become a bit of a celeb online. There's a guy, it's F1 Mike, and he's yeah. an AMG assembler, and I think he's, he's the top of the pyramid. He does the Black Series, he used to do SLRs. He, I think he used to work at the F1 assembly facility. Very cool. Um, so yeah, there aren't, I mean, that's, uh, they don't just, uh, I think it's an apprenticeship where you have to work your way into becoming one of the assemblers. Right, right. I mean, that's sort of the trend now, you know, like I have a Porsche Carrera GT and there is a Porsche Carrera GT guy that travels around the country and works on those. Yeah. Uh, McLaren, the F1, they have Panny, a guy named Panny. Uh, goes all over the world just servicing the 64 McLarens. You know, there's a guy named Tony for the Ford GT, same thing. And you get to know, they're like specialists, like having your dermatologist that's, or something. That's yeah. job security right there. It is job security. Oh yeah, when you got those cars, it's real job security. <laughs> yeah, but I love this hood. I mean, this really makes it easy and accessible. 720 horsepower right. uh, out of four liters. So, you know, almost 200 per, per liter is what I was trying to say. You know, I remember when 100 horsepower liter yeah. per liter was considered just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's pretty amazing, and four liters pretty small. Mm -hmm. You know, Americans don't really follow, but that's what, like 231 cubic inch. What was that? It'd be be like 260. 260. Yeah. Okay, but small. Yeah. Like yeah. A, a small. You know, you tend to think of these as having a big block. Yeah. V8 or some kind, but it's not. It's small, high. And ribbon. if you if you got all the shrouding away and with the turbos, you know, and another thing is in terms of uh, if you can shorten the length of the tubes, it helps throttle response. It right. also helps weight, you know, because right. tubing is heavy. Uh, the other thing that's striking is here is the center line of the front axle. Right. The front of the engine is way back here. Right. So this is a true mid-engine car. Right, right. People say, oh, it's not mid, it's as mid-engine as a Ferrari. Right. But it's just mid-front. Just mid-front engine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's about it's about 18 inches back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's the front I have an of the SLR, which is very similar yeah. to that. Which was, uh, I think, a lot of this came from what they learned on the SLR. You know, that Mercedes McLaren. Yes, uh, it, there was. I don't know if I should. It's not a secret. There was AMG was a little hacked. They're like, why'd you go to McLaren? That's what we do. Right. And so. Um, well, I know how that works. That happened to me the other day. Okay, I'm walking down the street. This guy goes, Jay. I go, yeah, Joe, Joe's Pizza. Oh, yeah, hey, Joe, how you doing? He goes, I was in another pizza shop. He goes, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm just getting a, you know, just getting a pizza. Was something wrong with our pizza? And then I lied. I went, no, I just had a coupon. He goes, he's using coupons? We all agreed we wouldn't use coupons. Okay, now I'm, I'm in a lie. Now I'm just, I'm in my pizza lie. I don't know how to get out of this. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. So you just have to. Turf, turf wars. Oh, man, you just have to go, Jay, what are you doing, man? I thought you like, yeah, this guy was like heartbroken that I was signing this other pizza. You know? You're yeah. breaking your vows. I know, exactly, exactly. I got caught cheating. <laughs> and what, do we, what else do we have? Let's see, okay. Uh, seven speed transmission? It's got a seven speed uh, dual clutch. Right, transaxle? And transaxle. Okay. Now, the dual clutch stuff isn't exactly new, but for a lot of people that don't understand why they shift so quickly, they were developed in Formula One, and basically you've got two sets of gears. You've got the odd gears and the even gears, mm -hmm. and what's happening during the shift, instead of coming out of one gear and going into the other, the next gear is already engaged, right. and so it's just switching from this, this engagement. It, it opens this and it closes this, so you don't have to disengage clutch, shift the gear, re-engage clutch. And so it happens in, in milliseconds. You know, I have a, a primitive, my Cord, my 1937 Cord, has a pre-selector. So you drive along in first gear, without touching the clutch, you shift the lever to second gear. Okay, now it's pre-selected it, and when you hit the clutch, boop, it shifts. There's nothing new. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing new. Basically, that's, mm -hmm. that's what it is, just an early version of that, yeah. Yeah, and, and same thing on down change now, of course, you've got the, the, rev, the rev matching, so right. it all happens on the paddles, and, and it used to be part of the skill 
of heel toe down shifting, matching the revs when you pull the gear through the gate now, it, it makes all of us look good. The thing I find so fascinating about the level of technology, whether it's this or the Lamborghini Huracan or any of those, is once you're inside, the car really shrinks around you. It feels like steering is light, brakes, you feel like you're in an MG or a Lotus. You, it really hides its weight incredibly well. You don't feel like you, you're throwing around 3,500 pounds, you know? No, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, that's a good way of putting it. This car obviously is lighter, but even in the bigger, you know, the bigger, you, you get in an S65 or something right. like that, which is well over 5,000 pounds. And the SUVs, it shrinks them, you know, the yeah. size of the brakes, the size of the tires, the amount of grip, how, uh, how well they're damped. And we're using Pilot Cup 2s on this. That seems to be the tire of choice these days, the Michelin. Yeah, I, I mean, they, they, uh, they're good at what they do. And again, uh, some of the gains, a lot of the gains, I don't know, uh, at the Nürburgring are from the tire war as well. And right. Michelin puts a lot of uh, effort into that. You know, there's, they're not the only ones. You know, they battle. Uh, Ferraris, you know, obviously like to work with Pirelli. You know, I've said this before. The one thing I like about Michelin's, and this sounds about, is the tires are actually round. And by that, I mean, it's amazing how many tires that you get that are not quite round yeah. and you can't figure out why you got a shake or a shimmy. Yeah. You know, I have what they call a tire shaver, which in the old days, you put your, your, your wheel on there, you'd spin it and you'd move the blade in and the blade would take off rubber. Maybe high spots. Huh? Yeah, like there was a company that made antique tires in the 60s and stuff and they weren't really very good. I, I remember I took a pound of rubber off it once on my 32 packet, it was going down the road and it would shake because there was a knot of rubber in the bowl. Might have been where they yeah, overlapped so, layers so or something. You made, yeah. So whenever I have missions, I always just check and they are perfectly round. Huh. I always find that you need less weights with Michelin's to balance a tire than almost any other tire. So it's just one of those deals. Well, and you think about this car is electronically limited at 202 miles an hour. Right. Think, I, I mean, if you did the calculation on how many revolutions per second at 202 miles an hour, and so literally a speck of dirt, and you see that in the race cars, if you right. pick up some rubber buildup or whatever, it'll, it'll cause a shake. But the spin balance at 200 miles an hour is incredibly... You know, a lot of people complain that they limit... I, I like that they limit the speed because then I don't... For example, if you buy your Bugatti Chiron, your tires are like $25,000 because they've got to be rated to 250 or 270, whatever it is. And miles spin balanced at 200. Right. Yeah. And you go, well, that's crazy. You're never going to do that on the street. Yep. And you're paying all this extra money for something that you'll never do. You know, so to me, it, it seems silly. I mean, if you're going 202 on a public road, you're going to jail. I'm sorry. This is, this is crazy. Yeah, and well, in, in, in certain places, I think in Canada, over a certain level, they, they, they don't just confiscate your car, they confiscate and sell your car. Right, yeah. You they, lose yeah. your car. And well, you know, it's funny, because now you might, I'm older than you, but when I was a kid, there were like four guys in the 200 mile hour club. Yeah. And, you know, Craig Breedlove and Art Arfons, and you meet these guys, and, you know, wow. it was a wow, they went 200 yeah. miles an hour. <laughs> now, yeah. you, you could go to Vegas and they They'll take you out in a, in a car at 200 miles an hour. Well, it is, I mean, you can't you can't fake your way to a sub seven minute lap, even if you have the car. Right. It's a little bit like Everest now. Yeah. You know, it used to be there was only a few people that made it up. Now yeah. the Sherpas almost carry them up. Yeah. You know, exactly. to a, to a exactly. certain uh, extent. So where else do we have? Are they AMG brakes? Are they Brembo? What are they? No, they're six piston, big six piston uh, Brembos. Oh, they are Brembos. Okay. Um, and you can there. It's a. Uh, a carbon ceramic you can see the sheen off of the right. disc there and one thing people you know formula one finally went to bigger wheels this year right what's behind it isn't just aesthetics behind bigger wheels bigger wheels allows bigger brakes and the bigger brakes gives you a, a bigger lever the further away from the center that you're clamping the more leverage you have to stop and right. that comes into play like at high downforce with a small brake you literally cannot lock the wheel at high speed because right. there's too much rotating inertia there's too much downforce and so you know ideally you want it, enough clamping power to lock the wheel and that's one of the driving things that really pays how quickly you can ramp up your force yeah i can remember style. we went to spain idiota racetrack in spain i think oh, that's that one written near barcelona yeah. and we had the slrs out in the track and i remember coming in after some you're doing some hot laps 
And I went, hey, the brake's on fire. It's just, it's just normal for a brake to be on fire. Don't worry. You know, I, I mean, I see flames. Flames, coming out. wow. They go, go back on the road. The, the, the wind will blow the flame out. Go back out, go back out. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, OK, I'll go back out. But yeah, I mean, wow. people don't realize how, just how much heat is in. Well, I mean, to a little, little lesson. I mean, when you burn fuel, only 30% of it goes to propel the car forward. Right. And then the rest of it has to, it, to come out either in wind resistance or heat in the brakes. Right, Those right. are the only things that, that slow the car down. And so if you're accelerating it, it's just massive heat right. that's coming out of, the, out of the brakes. All right, let's put this back okay. down. It's, it's stiff there hydraulics, but... Uh, uh, We'll go over the interior of the car when we, I guess, when we drive. Well, let's see. I mean, it's... Feel, feel how light that door is? Boy, that is a light door, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and it's twofold. Obviously, it's the shell, but even the material they chose this, they call it, it's like Alcantara D Dynamica. Right. Suede-ish, sort of, um, is, is lighter than leather. I remember they almost said that MB Tex. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. That was kind of a... And of course, by having the carbon fiber roof, you get your center of gravity, you get your weight lower. Yep. You know, it's like, you know, you put a normal steel roof on, it's like wearing a hat made of lead. You know, you're just doing this all the time, you know. Yes. Yeah. Um, lo weight lower and weight off of the unsprung. So anything that goes up and down on the springs or rotates, whether it's in the wheels and tires or in the powertrain, those gains are, are, are really, really great. And at what speed does this really come into effect? You can adjust this from inside? Yes. There's and an this is an air brake? Well, I mean, obviously there's just a ton going on at the back of the car now. The wings keep getting bigger and it's not for decoration. You got this biplane rear wing with a, an actual element that can be electronically adjusted from inside the car for extra downforce. But then also that not only creates its own downforce it also makes the underbody more effective by creating some you know some low pressure here it helps extract the air you've got a literally a double diffuser which used to be only a term you heard in formula one um shrouding around the exhaust you, know, you got, obviously when you run a diffuser another thing you got to deal with the heat from the exhaust so they right. they vent air around the exhaust so that it doesn't burn the diffuser um but you know just uh, this car all the Black Series were effectively developed as F1 safety cars. And so instead of just a single lap, they have to run lap after lap after lap right. and to and stay cool enough. So everything has its own cooler, whether it's the dips and the intercoolers and so forth. You can pound this car hard for 30, 40 minutes on the track. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing how good sports cars have become. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I, I sometimes get surprised if people put hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars into restoring a 20 year old performance car when one of these at really half the price would blow the doors off it. I mean, these are very expensive by any normal standard, but not by hypercar standards. Well, in terms of pure capability, even after putting the 200,000 in, it's it's not gonna run with this. Right, right. You know? yeah. And so there's something to be said that there's kind of, because of the lap time at the Nürburgring, 1200 pounds of downforce on the street really Nobody wants that yeah. because, you know, <laughs> where it, you feel it at 70, but it's really working at 130, 140, right, 150. Right. And when you're at 30 or 40, it's way stiffer as a result of it. And right. so, you know, that's, that's for everyone to choose where they want to fit on that spectrum. But now, now that that is a benchmark that has huge bragging rights, people are going to chase it. And, and it's optimize. funny because sometimes a car is safer at 150 than it is at 60 because there's no downforce and you can really get thrown off the road. But if you're going 150, it's pushing you on the road. Yes, it's, you, you literally feel it's stiff and then you feel it starting to get in sync and it feels way better. I mean, with 1,500 pounds of downforce, the thing is rock right. solid. There's w way more energy involved if you, if you make a mistake though. Yeah, well that's true. <laughs> yes. Well, let's take it for a ride and see let's what do you it. do. Come on. like the wheel. Yeah. It is a 
different sensation, though, than the normally aspirated one that you drove last. Right. The seat is actually very comfortable. Usually, I hate these sports seats. You know, the buttock clutching, you know, it, yeah. it's just not. Get one cheek in and the other one's up. On the... Yeah, yeah, but this one's OK. I like the steering wheel. And I like the, it just sits nice. It has nice posture, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It just feels right when you're in it. I'm not too low or too high. I thought I might be sitting too low in the seat, but I'm not. It's actually quite good. As a tall guy, I like how it's a trend. A lot of cars, the higher center, right? You right. know, and so because I, when you really drive it hard, you end up bracing yourself yeah. with your knees. And as a tall guy, sometimes it hits something that's not real comfortable. But I mean, you look at, I mean, just the, the interiors have gotten so beautiful. I mean, real carbon fiber here. Right. Um, beautiful, this stitching in this Patronus blue from the Formula One car, and you see the, yeah, the, you know, the, nice. the stripe on the seat. Uh, everything is an embossed uh, AMG logo in the center. And it's a little bit, the, the dynamic select mode allows it to have multiple, multiple personalities, you know? Yeah. And uh, there's preset. You can go comfort, all these sports, sport plus race. Yeah, this is very nice inside. Yeah. So, I mean, you have these preset modes, and when you go into Sport Plus, you see things like the exhaust lighting up, and then, but right. you can also select it independent. Like, if you say, I like Sport Plus because I like the quicker shifting and I like the faster revving, but I don't like the, the stiffer ride, you can, right. go, you can manually override and put it back into the well, software. you can make this an SL if you want, just a regular go to the, uh, you know, go to the country club SL. I have to say, comfort. this rides considerably better than my C63 Black Series. Really? Yeah. So this, you know, the dynamic select, you know, the, the mag ride. Well, she's got some grunt. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how far aerodynamics have come. Because back in 2005, I did that, you know, we did Talladega doing laps, you know, at 180, 190. And boy, that thing was walking all over the place. And, it, and, and they had tuned the suspension, but you know, after like an hour, you're like, eh, eh, eh. you could just feel it going. And then the last C7 Corvette, we're at uh, Meadowbrook, and we did about 50 laps at 204, 205. And it was fine. I mean, I'm uh, having a conversation and we're talking, and it wasn't, I mean, it, it, it's amazing how, how, how far it's come in 15 years. Which is a long time, isn't it? 50 it is a long time, but you, I mean, you think about the forces involved. We talked about for of a tire, but at 150 miles an hour, the thing is literally trying to come apart. Right. And you don't see failures. You know, it used to be when you drove down the road, you know, a long time ago in the 70s, always people changing tires. And right. you still get the occasional one, but they're pretty rare. Right, and just, right. I mean, just the advancement to be able to drive a car rock solid at over 150 miles an and hour. And the people I meet who pay no attention to the rate. Now, Z is the top, right? Yes. Z is the top. OK, I remember there was a, is that the Silver State Classic, I think? Yep. And some guy shows up with a Ferrari, and he's got new tires, but they are not Z. They are rated to 120. Yep. And he's running 150, apparently blew out a tire. I think he killed his wife, a sad story. Uh, I mean, because he was running at a sustained speed, which the tire could, the tire was not rated for that. Yeah. Couldn't take it. You yeah. know? He chose to save some money and not put on the expensive tire. Reminds me of the old uh, Bell helmet commercial. Have a ten dollar head, wear a ten dollar helmet. Right, right, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I mean, we're all kind of guilty of it though, because you know the sticker shock of of a new set of these Michelins. Right, right. And, and, I know. The grip isn't free, they wear out faster also, right. which is I, perfect I for the tire companies, right? The greatest invention ever for tire companies was the sport of drifting. Yeah, boy, they just, yeah, oh, that's crazy. One after another. I, I find it interesting. I don't feel the need to do it. I don't like to, I always feel like I'm dam damaging the car. You know, like launch control. I never use it. Yeah. Cars feel like I'm twisting metal. And I, just from years of, Bending a coat hanger, eventually, bink, it's going to break, yeah. you know? And uh, obviously, it's stronger than that. But just the idea that you're constantly twisting. Torquing it. Torquing tor 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 yeah. yeah. I don't know how that doesn't. To me, my favorite mode, you're driving 5 or 10 miles now, you nail it. Yeah. You get a rolling resistance. You take off from the roll. Freeway on-ramp, roll in. Right, yeah, yeah that, that's what I like. The idea of sitting there, pressing launch control, hold the 
breakdown. Why are you still? Okay, me and all the other guys left already. Okay, he just blew your doors off. He took off while you're <laughs> trying to get into the launch control. Be a good time, I guess, to talk about the actual stats. You know, zero to 60 is 3.1 seconds, which is impressive, but it's not as low as they go. Right. Zero to 125 in nine seconds. That's one that, because you can't, you know, once you start getting up against a little arrow and the right. gears get a little bit longer, that is crazy impressive. You know, this is something you can drive to San Francisco. Yeah. I noticed when we went through that little bit of chop, you know, in the, you know, the repairs on the road back there, uh, again, dramatically better than my C63 Black right. Series, which doesn't have the adjustable shocks. How many miles do you have on yours? I'm at about 7,000. Oh, that's in all. 10 years, okay. so yes. Oh, okay. So not a, a you know, it's amazing. Thousand miler, but not a 20,000. I've got that Porsche Carrera GT, and driving it over the years, and then it's two, it's a 2004. About 2009, I felt. Yeah, I'm on the freeway and bam, and I'm hitting bumps and like jumping to the lanes. I, and I realized my suspension, I was losing like 5% a year, just just seals wear or whatever. Uh, and I realized the car's not, they're not that many miles on it, yeah. seven, 8,000. What about my shocks? And the shocks are completely gone. I put new shocks on it, change it. It's like a brand new car again. Huh. And I went, oh, okay, there you go. But you don't realize, you know, that. This stuff deteriorates. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of the exhaust note? I, I think it's it's the right mix of raspy and yet civilized. Right. Yeah. You know, it's good. Well, it's still a Mercedes. It's like a race car in a tuxedo, you know? <laughs> it's that kind of deal. But boy, it tracks nicely. And the center line is exactly straight. I hate it when I'm driving in the center line yeah, is yeah. over here. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. 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 Wow. Feels yeah. faster over here. Yeah, I did, of course. It's a very un-Mercedes-like exhaust note, I must yeah. say. It does shrink around you. I have to say, you know, the things like that send a message to you to your brain right. like if this car was a the exact same car and the steering wheel wasn't really well ex executed you wouldn't like the car as much right you know and it's it's what you it's like the face of the car that you look at right the right grip paddles right where they're supposed to be i like the black uh, when they've gone to the you know, the powder coated black or whatever it is well, I want to thank Robert for letting us borrow this car. We couldn't get one from Mercedes. I know. We had to call Hershevec. Yeah. It's funny, when you look at a lot of the cars in the 30s, Tatra, uh, some of the early aerodynamic, even Citroën, uh, 0.27. I mean, very low. Wow. Because they didn't care about downforce. They didn't go fast enough. Yeah. yeah. Now, when were the first wind tunnels used on cars? Well, the first wind tunnels were for airplanes. Right. But I'm thinking of. I'm not sure when they were. I'm not. I'm not sure. You know what the. You know what the. Uh, the Stanley brothers did. When they, they they had the world's fastest car in 1906, at uh, 127 miles an hour, Stanley Steamer. And what they did, they went to the every canoe company in New England, and they would pull canoes through the water, and they would use. A, a pull that would show how many pounds it took. A fish scale or yeah, something. Yeah, to, to pull it, yeah. Ah. How many pounds. And I think the Lakeview Canoe Company had the sleekest canoes. So they took two canoes, put one on top of the other, put the engine inside it, and that's how they set the record. Get out. So they didn't just say, what makes this slippery? They literally used the canoe as well, the body. Well, I, I guess you'd call the fluid aerodynamics. Uh, You're using water, yes, yeah. you know? And so if the water didn't ripple around, then it went, oh, okay. And it only took two pounds versus five pounds to pull a boat. You're going to go with the canoe. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's cool that you brought that up because that's a great way for people to, you can actually visualize what yeah. the dynamics of air do that, in water. And one of the things that, that you don't want in water or in air is 
uh, separation. Right. And so bubbles, um, like when you see a, a dolphin, it can actually be above the surface of the water because of the skin of the dolphin keeps the surface attached, it has less drag. Right. They're doing the same thing. All A lot of the stuff you see on the front of Formula One cars and all those uh, vortex generators are to bend the air without it tumbling, right. without it separating. You know, the build quality is what really impresses. The build quality, but also the rigidity to make it light. There's these right. carbon shear panels in the front and the back. There's actually a carbon cross tube. And the idea is you want what isn't supposed to move to be as rigid as you can right. so that the stuff that does move can be as compliant as it can be. So you can control it and tune it in a nutshell. Yeah, but this road, you know, is lots of undulation, some crown to it, stuttery bumps. Good development road, really, for ride and handling. And explain this uh, traction control. Most cars, you just turn on traction control or turn it off. This is completely adjustable, isn't it? Yeah, this button here, you can go, and it goes into sport handling mode. Right. But then if you push and hold, watch right. this, all of a sudden it all of a sudden it lights up. Right. There's a nine stage traction control and so you can tune it to your driving style and or condition. So when we're at the academy, we use this um, like when we give taxi rides, when these Michelin Pilot Sport 2, PS uh, Cup Sport 2s are cold, they are pretty slick. And right. so until you get a little heat in, you, you dial up the TC number and then some people run it all the way down, some people run it on two or three clicks, but uh, it, it becomes a tuning aid rather than just a keep you out of trouble aid. Right, right. And can you turn it off completely or? You can, so if this is dialed. You can turn it off completely. Yeah, I mean, this, if this is dialed like that, it would, it would basically have zero protection. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so I'll put it back on for you. For, so when you're doing these rips and the boost kicks, we don't right. look out the side window. But it's just, it's just one more, you know, thing. It's, it's a cool thing to talk about and for a driver to have that flexibility. But again, you know, for uh, Nürburgring, um, you know, wet weather conditions, you, you would definitely want some TC right. assistance. I don't care who you are. You drive this, you compare this to like an early, a 70s Porsche 930 Turbo. Right. Violent and not half as fast, but the way it kicks and you know. And I remember that was 240 horsepower. Yeah. That was, whoa, I remember people, you gotta bend that thing, it's too quick. Yeah. yeah. Zero to 60 and 5.0, I still remember yeah. from the table in the front of road and track. Right, right. It's funny how that works, you know, there were certain road and track covers that are burned into my mind. Mm -hmm. Shelby standing there smiling with the GT40, the Cobra and the Mustang all in the same yeah. shot. You know, I, I don't know, it's probably because we did not have any other influences. You had to wait every month yes. to see what the new cars are going to look like. You know, now you go on the internet and you see everything. So I don't know if magazines have that. I don't know if kids even save magazines the way they did when I was young. I still have my complete set of road and track. And really? Yeah, oh, yeah. I remember the uh, issue with the Chaparral and Dan yeah. Gurney for president and all the things that they have because it was your only connection to cars. Yeah. You maybe you watched uh, uh, Chris Economaki on Saturday, you know, at some race on the well, A couple times story. a year, maybe. Maybe yeah. twice a year, right? It's that. And, and of course, the Indy 500. But that was it. You just yeah. never saw race car drivers moving around as people, you know? Well, I mean, I, I try to remind people what it was like to have such a limited amount to get your hands on. And I remember when I went to my first sports car race. I, I guess I kind of knew the racing existed somewhere, but I hadn't seen it. Yeah. And I went, and I, my, my life changed that day. Yeah. And whereas now, my, my nieces, you know, five, six years old, they're scouring the internet for, and they know about hundreds of species of animals, I mean, I know. And, and cars, and uh, so it, it's a different era. You know, there are pros and cons of each. There was a, you know, the specialness and the anticipation. Whoa. Even that little gully, it, it, you know, soaked it up pretty nice. Very nice. What I love about it is the science of it. It's all so crisp, you know, because some of the guys build the super car and they get uh, some variation of a Corvette motor. 
and rah, rah, it's loud and it seems to be moving quickly, but it's not doing with with any scalpel-like precision. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like a, like a machete. It's just sort of yep. making a lot of noise and blowing a lot of smoke. And you know, uh, this it's the reason I love my P1 McLaren. It's just it's just so laser sharp in everything that it does. And the way this thing shifts, it's just. I mean, you couldn't possibly outshift it, you know. Well, the funny thing is, if you drove this car in its first iteration and development, none of that was that way. Yeah. And so it took a bunch of some really good drivers, really good engineers to say, nope, you got to take someone out of that. You got to add more to that. You got to, you know, the way the clutch engages, disengages. And it's just, this is a sorted, developed car. Yeah. And it gives you such great respect for the engineers who develop stuff. Because you get people that come to the garage all the time with sort of homemade supercars, the supercars they're producing in a limited number, mm -hmm. and just things rattle and they don't, they don't quite work. You know, they, I mean, you know, anybody can make a car go fast. To get this window not to squeak or leak air or, you know, just whatever, all the little problems, the thousands of problems that you have. Well, I see Robert, why Robert likes this thing so much. It really is. You know, it's so funny. <laughs> when these kind of cars get damaged, it seems like it's almost impossible to fix them because the level of fitting and craftsmanship that goes into the initial assembly, you know what I mean? I don't know how a body shop or anybody could recreate it, you know? It, it seems like it would be almost impossible. It would, it would depend on how badly, uh, by the same token, GT race cars now are these cars, and they are fixed now. I guess that's true. You yeah. know, um, there's a difference, so nobody pays attention to fit and finish and ride, right. and right. ride quality and squeaks and rattles. So in terms of the dynamics, you could probably get it, depending on the damage, some of them are write-offs. Well, I want to thank Robert Hershevec for letting us borrow this. We love Robert. He's a great car guy. He's been to the garage many times, and the fact that he <laughs> He trusts me with his car. I wouldn't, but I, I certainly appreciate it. Robert, thank you, my friend. Tommy, thank you too, sir. Thank Always you, Jay. Always a pleasure to have you. Always enjoy your knowledge and your wisdom. And, and you have real exper experience with these cars, so you get somebody who is, who's been there and experienced it and, uh, and knows the brand. That's my favorite thing. You know, a lot of time we get marketing guys, and hang on, they got to go check the sheet, you know, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But, or they're just spinning it out without, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, I, I grew up, I remember when that hammer was on the cover of Road and Track. Right. And I'm like, what? You put a 32 valve V8 in a sedan? So. What was that, 1989, 88? It, was it either 84 or 89? I don't remember. It was it? I thought it was earlier than that. I thought it was, it may have been. I think, early to mid 80s. I mean, it is amazing how far we've come. I mean, I mean, 400 horsepower used to be the end of the line. I mean, that was. Yeah. You're not going to get much more than that in the streetcar. Now you've got close to a thousand horsepower in some cases, 800, 900, 720. Well, to be honest, traction control is why that's happened. Until right. then, there was sort of a limit because you couldn't control it. Right. And right. so, even though people hated it when it first came and still hate it to some degree, a it's gotten better. Right. And it, it helps people. A lot of people like to turn it off, and they shouldn't. Um, but like ABS, it's better than the best driver in certain circumstances. I mean, I always like it sometimes when they'll take modern race car drivers, young guys in their 20s, and put them in, you know, an old Jimmy Clark Lotus, or, and they're just astounded. Oh my God, how, I mean, they're not going as fast, but it actually must seem faster mm -hmm. because of the shaking and the lack of protection. and. You know, you got 70 gallons of gasoline on each side. Vagueness of, of the steering, all the deflection going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think mean, it's just crazy.